artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. So let's welcome Paul Ramirez Jonas. It's such a delight to have you. What a phenomenal human being. Um, great artist. I had the pleasure of working with you on Key to the City, but I also had the pleasure of working with you as a uh, as, as you as one of our board members and friend and co-conspirator in the what became a uh, emerging thing called socially engaged art. But certainly That's at the right. time it was just, there was a time when it's called relational aesthetics. And then there was a time when it's called social practice, but I think you've had a front row seat to the emerging world of just sculpture that does stuff in public space. Um, and you've talked about- Actually, yeah. yeah. Sorry, no, go, go. go ahead, no, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I remembered that I was just like, I do these things and what started to make me think, oh, there's this thing called social practice and I belong to it was when I met Lexa. Uh, oh, no way. <laughs> and, the, and the PSU MFA social practice invited me to come over to spend some time with them. And I was like, oh, look, <laughs> context. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 cool to know. I mean, certainly you do, you, you didn't even know you had a tribe and you had one. Um, exactly. But you certainly, I mean, just to kind of dig in a little bit, you've taught at Hunter College for a long time as a faculty member. You've also, you know, you've you've had an early interest in um, uh, language and um, what's called analytic philosophy. You were interested in truth statements and you had an, an amazing foray into both conceptual practice um, as well as public projects. And I felt like your work, you know, some artists have a thing they do and they do it over and over and over again, but the robust range of your work has probably also followed your own interests and also how the world evolves because your practice is quite varied, um, certainly often dealing with sculpture, but it would be too reductive to call you a sculptor by a, a large margin. You're also a new father to a two-year-old, I believe, right? So, so yeah. And then you have a I'm daughter. I'm candid. What? Yeah, I have a daughter going to college in August and a little one learning to speak. <laughs> there you go. Well, there you go. So one more time. Um, <laughs> totally. And congrats on that, Paul. Um, that's Thank That's wonderful. You. So let's let's start with um, you know by, by the way just as a note welcome to the alternative art school it's great to have you Paul because of course the milieu you know well and it's it's you're just so such a fitting person for this and I also for me it's self serving because I'd love for you to get a feel for the vibe here and what we do um, it's 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 a particularly special place we worked on for a year and a half we this thing is a child of the pandemic in a sense and um, and we found that the internet doesn't just connect cities, it connects homes. And that we've been in each other's homes a lot for the last two years, and it's been really special. Um, I would like to start with just, you know, you're, you're an artist um, by way of Honduras. And I'd like to just start your, with your kind of beginning story of like, what got you into art? Um, because you've clearly been doing it a while. <laughs> oh, that's an in interesting story. and. Um... And if we need it, I have some images, but I think it's better if, if everyone just looked at the links then maybe we can just talk. And, uh, but what started me as an artist, I'm a, uh, it's funny because I've been in academia now for a long time. So I read all these application essays and, and there's always the application essay to MFA that says, I knew I wanted to be an artist when I was six. And then at Hunter, we would always laugh because we'd be like, that's just because the earliest memory a human can retain is six years old. <laughs> you know? but, uh, but I was not that person. I, I grew up in Honduras. Uh, and at the time there, was, there were no art museums in Honduras yet. And, uh, and there was very little in the way of culture. It was like a theater that only sporadically would put up plays. Like it was like a big event. It wasn't like even every year. So, uh, culture didn't exist as it exists in the industrialized world, you know? So uh, I didn't know I wanted to be an artist. Uh, I didn't even think I wanted to be an artist till I was my first year in college when I came to the United States. And I took an art course mostly because I had never been able to take an art course before. Mm -hmm. So I was curious. And then I took, and it was like the gateway drug, you know, it's like you take one 
and that was fun. And then you make another course and then you take another and then you take another. And then um, by the time I was a senior, I was uh, starting to really fail out of my computer science degree. Um, and, uh, but I realized I had taken so many art courses I could actually just get a degree in art. Yeah. Uh, but it was a little schizophrenic because I was applying for jobs in the computer science industry, which was just turning over to what you're all talking to me from, a lot, you know, like uh, away from mainframes and into self-contained computers. And then, uh, and I was also applying to MFAs because I was like, I don't know, I'll just like throw the dice and see what happens. Um, and then I went to an MFA. <laughs> so where did you do your undergrad and where'd you do your grad if that's I'm just curious I did my undergrad at, at Brown University and my grad at RISD oh just down the way just down the way and I, I was very green I don't recommend doing this I basically applied to grad schools uh, my criteria was do I need to take a GRE no I'm applying to the school <laughs> And then I just compared who gives me the best financial aid package. And I just went to the one that was the cheapest. And hey, that's well, listen, how I, I want, I mean, I don't want to just, I, I realized you brought images and I think it is good. But no, we don't have to look be, at them. No, but I think it's good because I think it, for, for those that don't know your work, it's nice to get, you know how it is. And art, art says a lot. Some art says a lot. Some art, you got to explain a lot. But can you show just some pictures of stuff you've done just to get us rooted in some art practice? Yeah, and, and just to uh, just because it, it it's it's it, this occasion because I'm happened to be working on it and um, and Nate is here and I didn't know Alexa was going to be here but uh, when I went to Portland State that first time I showed images of Key to the City in progress so it's it's sort of like an interesting setting so if I'm I'm just going to share my screen I'm going to say the magic words of the post pandemic universe can you see this then you all nod yes and then, uh, Yes. All right. Well, so I'm gonna go really fast, just so we don't have to love it. Much love, it doing. love it. Love it. Love it. Love uh, it. I'll do just do a little recap of Key to the City. Uh, not how I got here, or why, but uh, or how many times we pitched it to Creative Times. <laughs> I think it was like two or three times over the years. Uh, but uh, Key to the City had two aims: one to take this honor, the Key to the City. Um, which uh, is completely symbolic and try to make it, take it down from being symbolic and making it actual. So um, the first thing was to find sites, 24 sites distributed, decentralized on the city of New York and methodically changing locks so that the key to the city would become a master key to spaces in the city. And all these spaces together, what we're trying to do is to create a kind of portrait of the limits of public and private in a city and, and just different reflections on how we live in public space. So we had things like a PO box in the Bronx. Um, we had the baptismal chamber of St. John the Divine. So again, so like now the key to the city actually would open these gates. Um, we had a lamppost in Bryant Park because this is a kind of space, right? A kind of public spaces infrastructure. So we were interested in that. So you could actually uh, turn the light on and off of this public lamppost. This is an American flag outside Daniel Trump's uh, office, uh, at the time an elected council member. Now I think he's in jail for corruption, but uh, there's a vitrine with the American flag. So we changed the lock. So you, the key to the city could open uh, and you could look at the flag. This is in Dumbo, one of the last and uh, oldest functioning uh, um, uh, boxing gyms in the city. So you could open a locker. And each of these sites was in negotiation with the site. So we, we would go with Gavin Krober and we would try to convince them. And then once we convinced them, they're like, well, what do you want to open? And then the conversation turned and it was like, well, what do you want to show people about your institution or, or your site? Uh, my, like my job was really to, the artwork is to convince you to increase the publicness of your site, but now it's up to you, like, what do you want to feature? So for example, people like Gleason's Gym, when you open the locker, they have a curated, quote unquote, like a little thing with gloves about the gym. Um, this is Tortilleria Nixtamal, which has unfortunately did not survive the pandemic, uh -huh. but it's the only Tortilleria uh, kind of taco place in the city that makes its own Nixtamal. So they changed the lock to the door to their kitchen. Uh, 
And this is probably one of the most incredible moments in my life. This is uh, the gates to the city of New York. If you enter the city on foot from New Jersey, you go through these gates. And again, this was a conversation. Like we sat in a boardroom with the board of governors of the uh, MTA, you know, and then- It was, it was, they, it was actually the, um, it was Port Authority. Port Authority, that's right. And then they were like, well, we want to participate because we want to show that this is in the public trust, but we are also in the business of making sure we have huge security issues. It was so, like the head of fire yeah. and the head of police were in this meeting. It was the most ridiculous bureaucracy I'd ever seen. Just for I this, know, but, for but this I find, yeah, but I think civil servants get it. Civil yeah. servants get public card, even though they're very cautious. And uh, this is their choice. You know, I was aiming at some doors in, in the bus station, but they're like, you know what would be great? Go look at this. So, uh, so we did that. And the second aim of the piece is like, yeah, make the key actual, but then who gets the key and who gets to decide who receives this award? It, it is the power of the mayor to give the key to someone. It's someone not like you or me. It's someone who has entered history in some way. Uh, through sports, through heroism, through notoriety, and they are the only ones who get it. So there was this prolonged conversation and negotiation with the mayor's office until they agreed to actually devolve their power so that any citizen could award the key to the city to whomever they wanted. And, and so like this exchange could happen between citizens. So we made 24,000 copies of the new key to the city. Uh, on the day of the opening, the mayor came and proclaimed that he was devolving his power. He also gave us a big favor because this was his weekly press conference. We brought all the press, um, so we got instant coverage. This was the design. Uh, and then the main distribution site, but there were other distribution sites that we don't have time to go over, was in Times Square. So people would form a line, there would be volunteers who'd be like, uh, are you here to get the key to the city? And they were like, no, I'm here to get Broadway tickets. And they'll be like, oh, next line. Or, uh, or they would be like, no, I'm here to get the key to the city. And then the volunteers would say, no, you can't get the key to the city, you can only give it away. So volunteers would pair strangers together. So they would get to know each other while they waited in line to see why they deserve it. And people came in pairs or triads or fourths. Then after the line, you would get a passport, your keys. Then you went down a ceremonial red carpet to a tiny commons we built in Times Square. And there was a plinth uh, in the middle that held records because this was an official award. And those records were filled out with your name, why you were giving the key to the city and to whom. And because this is the United States of America, you were also secretly signing a waiver of liability, <laughs> which is the small print at the bottom. Uh, uh, yeah. I love bureaucracy and I'm always like, how do you fold it into the piece? And then once that was done, there was actually something I had to speak out loud, a ceremony, a speech act, where you bestowed the key on someone else. This is what the passport looked like. And, you know, and then there were different types of people. There were like a lot of families came, which kind of threw us a little bit for a loop because I always conceived it was one to one. But there was a lot of three to two or four to four. Uh, there were a lot of love stories that happened. I think there was a wedding. There was also this couple that I think was their 50th anniversary and they had met in Times Square. So they came. Oh. Just to put in perspective, we gave 18,000 keys away over a period of four weeks. Um, these are strangers giving the key to each other. Uh, we also had things like the, the security awesome. and cleaning crew came and approached us and they were like, we can never participate because we're at work when you're open. So then we had like a super early ceremony just for people who work in Times Square. So it was like a mass bestowal. Uh, and then something that I think we talked a lot about creative time that it was, I think really one of the first times Creative Time really achieved this thing where they had an incredibly diverse audience. And, uh, and something that really slowly dawned on me is that it's really hard to make work like this. The cultural infrastructure we have of white cubes is climate controlled. There's bathrooms, there's security, there's air conditioning, there's places to get snacks. When you make this kind of work, Creative Time and I, we had to think of everything. Who staffs it? Where do they go to the bathroom? Where do they get water? What if they're too hot? They need shade. Um, who guards this at night? We had to arrange that. 
it is so much harder than putting something on a site that's made for art. But what you gain is that you address a public that looks like our country. And uh, our institutions are not doing that yet. So if you really want to address a public that reflects who we are, for now, you still have to step out of art institutions. Um, and that's something I slowly realized with this project, because it's like, why am I doing this? It's so hard. And then when you see who's participating, you notice the difference in who's participating. Uh, it's one of my favorite sites, uh, the Brooklyn Museum. There's a concealed door with George Peel behind the George Peel portrait, so you could peek in. So this is what a viewer might experience. Uh, the ability to peer behind a white wall, you know? It's very Scooby-Doo. Yeah. It's like a secret door. But also participants, it's so authorless that participants sort of take uh, possession of it. So something we didn't expect is, uh, Participants started to write letters to future participants. So the PO box started to get mail. Uh, and the mail was like this, dear key holder, key holder. So to a key holder from a key holder, right? Like, like this kind of connection between people who don't know each other, recommending that they go to another site that's nearby. Uh, also rituals were invented. People started to sign the door to the kitchen of the restaurant. Uh, also like a kind of like a black market of keys on eBay emerged uh, oh, yeah. and so forth. I can stop now, but I can just show you really super fast. Yeah. We're in the middle of securing all the sites in Birmingham. Uh, so we're thinking about gender space. This is a Victorian uh, urinal for men that we think we're gonna reopen, uh, but make it um, kind of genderless or not gender determined. Uh, there's the Museum of Minerals, and we're working on them on having a vitrine in their museum that you can actually open the vitrine. It's just a really transgressive thing that you could do in a museum, like you actually open the display case, and they want to have uh, parts of the bedrock of the city, and we're even trying to see if you can get enough parts of the bedrock that people can take little chunks of it. Uh, there's an observatory, we're on negotiations to opening that up. Some of the sites are really boring. Like you go to this observatory, it seems so interesting and they're observing the sun, but this is the instrument because the sun's so bright. It's just like a pinhole. <laughs> so people expect a telescope, but it's like, there's this uh, house that's, uh, it's like a tenement house that we're gonna be able to open. And something we tried and tried and tried and tried in New York and we could never do it. This is Daniel. Daniel is just the citizen of Birmingham he's opening his private home. He's gonna uh, allow people to go into his garden, which is kind of like awesome. He's an incredible guy. Uh, and this, we also tried in New York and we couldn't do it. We were gonna have an empty tomb. So, cause you know, that's what's weird about public space. When we die, we are put in public display for eternity. It's like a really weird thing, right? It's like. Now that I'm dead, I'm just gonna uh, yeah, be yeah. out there in a public space. I didn't uh, realize that you kind of become public art when you die. Exactly. Uh, and at the end of the platform in the main station, there's a door that leads to underground tunnels, and the train station's like, "Yeah, let's do it." And this, unfortunately, just fell through yesterday. Sorry. This is a, a department store, and the skin of the building changes color, and they're going to allow people to enter the control room and change the color of the entire building. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. um, like I know. And a mosque, and this is a, a restaurateur. When you show him the key, he will give you a different menu than the menu that's in the restaurant, because he was saying how this is his restaurant is based on home cooking that he's had to adapt for public consumption. So oh. when you show him the key, he'll bring you a different menu that are basically his mom's recipes and he'll cook it for you. Ooh. Uh, he's super smart. He totally understood this public-private thing and, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, the end. Stop share. <laughs> hey, let's give it up for Paul. A sneak preview of his Birmingham part, his, his long, much-anticipated sequel, um, Interestingly, the only people who were ever interested in redoing Key to the City were the people from Birmingham. It's the same nonprofit for 11 years has been trying to redo it. 
and uh, and they finally raise the money. Like, and they're like, we're ready. So I think every city should do it. I mean, if, <laughs> just as a note, Paul's open to possibly doing it. I think it's such an elegant, beautiful project. Um, thank, congrats. I'm so glad it's happening in Birmingham. I, I love that project. And just to clarify my own role with it was only that Paul had been pitching it to Creative Time forever. And when I got there, I was like, this project's awesome. And, the, and they were like, oh, you like that one? I was like, yes, it's like amazing. And Paul, Paul's like, oh, they really want to do it now? And I was like, yes. And, no. and so, <laughs> right? Yeah. I remember, uh, I remember NATO, you ran out of the office to call me from the street on your cell phone. Yeah. Tell me, you got to pitch it now. <laughs> this is the time. <laughs> it's such a good project. But for the record, yeah. too, I mean, you didn't show it in the slides, but you do have, I, I forget, the, I mean, bear with me, I'm the worst interviewer, but like you had that project in Massachusetts where you took an extant green space and then made it a public park with, and gave people their own keys. Yeah, there's been many key projects. It's been um, a tiny, tiny park in, in Massachusetts, in, in uh, Cambridge that the 5,000 households have. And used to be a tiny traffic island and I turned it into a permanent park. But I'm really interested in these negotiations with the real world with civic entities. So the same way that there was this negotiation with the mayor, the negotiation for uh, in Massachusetts was that the park became a, is now a park in the park system. It is the smallest park in the park system. How I mean, small it's like, is it? It's uh, 64 square feet. Oh. So, so it's, eight feet by eight feet, roughly. It's right? basically, it's a triangle, but it's roughly 64 square feet. <laughs> I mean, the other key project I've done was change the key to the front door of, of the museum where the Sao Paulo Biennial is shown. Right. So people, People could go and let themselves in uh, into the pavilion after hours um, when the, it was closed. Or recently in Mexico for a uh, for a museum for Humex, I made the, their their closet where you put your backpacks and everything became a a display case like a museum display case with spots. So people were like curating this show by opening the lockers and keeping the key and then putting their backpacks. And there was a little shelf where you could choose an object from your backpack and put it on display. So at any one moment you came, you know, in the lobbies, like this big display case with like uh, backpacks and little objects kind of like on display. And didn't you do a project as well where you copied people's keys? Yeah. And it, it's interesting to see something like key to the city and to be like, well, how the hell do I ever do something like that? You know, but the first one was super DIY. It was me with a machine. Uh, I, and I did it in the border. So I did it in Tijuana and San Diego. And what I would do is I would ask people, show me your keys. And they would show me like, you know, like a million keys. And it'd be like, take me to every single thing this key opens. So the shed, the boat, the motorcycle, the house, but because of how the border works, um, more often than not, it meant crossing the border. Because someone would be like, well, my grandma, who's from Mexico, I have a spare key to her house. So we had to cross the border. And then once I finished with a subject, it would lead to the next subject. So all to say, made this weird uh, illustrated lecture I would give. And at the end of the lecture, I would take out a key to my house. And I'd be like, Anyone here in the audience can have a key to my house if you let me copy any key from your keychain. And then, um, so we would do the first thing. And then I would take the key of the stranger and I'd be like, anyone can have this new key if you come up and, and exchange it for one of your keys. So if you think of key to the city, it's all done with like this budget. I wrote almost 250 thank you notes that were not just like, uh, Casual. They're like 250 people in Key to the City really made it happen, right, in some way or another. But the first one was really like small, right? It's just like the, uh, but I don't think one's better than the other. You know, it's just well, we can always ask like how many people are not, right? I mean, I mean, for the record, I just it's it's, it's a point out the obvious, but I think it's so magical, which is a, it's a sculptural object that has utility. 
Yes. <laughs> it doesn't also just have utility. It also is something that touches on the private, public, and people's own sense of anxiety of safety. Because there's something kind of bold about handing a stranger a key that you won't, right? Your brain goes, right. what happens if, right? Which I think is kind of powerful. No, and I, I'm most interested how we make meaning, you know, it's like how, uh, let me, let me see. It's like, uh, right, like I have this. Why is this meaningful? It's not meaningful. For. It's not meaningful because it's the Buddha. It's meaningful because it's one of the first presents my oldest daughter gave me when she was teeny. So it's like, it's the Buddha. Yeah, but it's also a present from my daughter. Uh, but when you got the key to the city of New York, it was like, it's a key to the city, but Aunt Susie gave it to me, right? So I was really interested on in how like uh, this big symbol and something very personal and private could come together. Um, and I'm still trying to figure things like that out. Like how do you uh, take like societal meeting and, and private intimate meeting. And I think Merle Latterman Eucles is to me always sort of like the, the person I always think about when she made touch sanitation from 71 to 74, where she shook hands with every single sanitation worker. And I thought, on the one hand, that piece is super intimate. So it's like, it's like it, it narrows down and it scales up, right? Yeah. It's like, we can talk about it in this way within the idea of public art, but there's someone out there that is like, this artist shook my hand and packed me personally for keeping the city clean. And those two extremes are really interesting. I love it so much. I just have to say, I love Key to the City so much. I think it's such a successful, incredible project. And if anybody here does have connections to a city, do it in your town. It was so awesome. And, and I also loved Paul, such a magical, versatile thinker. Like he would say things that blew my mind. Like you could put locks on things that are already open and then you just <laughs> get to open it again. Like, yes. like you could like, he's like, you don't need to just go to locks that exist. You can add locks and then have people open it. And then they suddenly are excited. They get access to something that they already had access to which I thought was kind of like, oh, hadn't even occurred to me. And then also the kind of poetics around class and race and gender geographies, that the city became a poetics of scale, whether it's next to mall to George Washington Bridge, um, and that ability to connect a personal narrative and across, race, across a lot of different categories of demographics that you were mentioning, does sort of so a tapestry of the cosmopolitan urban body that's fascinating because it's both specific in its human scale, but there's right. a large scale. So there's also a certain kind of story told. Um, I would love for folks to um, ask some questions and um, that's just one piece. Paul has a me many, many projects, many. He is a consummate producer. Uh, Alexa did in the chat ask um, to describe the cabinet magazine location. Oh, that is a completely cabinet's madness and they can take full credit. I was just interested that they had a, a weird window that used to have an AC. So it had like a, they could open the window from the outside and then there were like weird bars on the inside to hold the AC. So I was like, oh, it's interesting because someone can open the window from the outside with the key and kind of like stick their head into the cabinet office. Uh, but they weren't happy with that. So they created a thing that you open the window and nothing really interesting seemed to happen. And they had put a, it activated a soap bubble machine, right? Like so, that was above in some music. And then soap bubbles kind of start to descend on you. Uh, and, and that's what I love about this project. It's like people just, um, like I didn't go to the restaurant with the intention of having this whole menu thing happen in Birmingham. It's like you just go and, and you have to be somewhat passive or a good listener, let's say. And you're like, you maybe have a decoy idea of what you want to do. And then you just engage people and uh, people are amazing. Like the, there's something really frightening happened in, cemetery, in, in the cemetery in Birmingham because I was like, well, I know this is what we want. Like, I really want a tomb. I hope I can get it. And then the guy who was showing us around was like, hey, do you want to see the crematorium? And we're like, sure. And um, like, come see it 
and it's like and there's like the big oven and it's like on it's like look there's like a people and i look in and there's like bones like fire one and i'm like oh he's uh cremating someone now it's like wait a few minutes because i'm gonna put in the next one and then we look around there's like a coffin and sure enough we some scrape the ashes and that's uh i didn't have the courage to say like well, can we put a key to that but uh it's it's just interesting to go without preconceptions and listening to people and then kind of see where it goes. Um, <laughs> the next one. The next like, one. <laughs> you mean a body? The next body? Um, yeah. Hey, wait. So Jay, Jay, I was going to ask. Um, Jay, can do you? Are you? I, your camera's off, but can you ask the question yourself, or do is it okay? Oh, you got your mic off. Wait. Jay, you're muted. No worries. There you go. Unmute. So, so we talk about a lot about art, artists and the ability to uh, support themselves. And, um, we talk a lot about the, um, the infrastructure of art uh, today and how big institutions operate and uh, how it fits into kind of this philanthropic complex. So you mentioned that uh, it took the people in Birmingham a long time to raise the money to do this. So I'm interested in, I'd be interested in the cost, but how do you calculate? How do you make sure that everybody along the chain is kind of fairly treated financially? How do you work that out? I just, I don't know, and I'd, I'd be interested. So. Thanks, Jay. That, that's interesting because with, after Key to the City, uh in new york i realized that it relied on so many volunteers right so i've made similar works that are not about keys but are very similar they're like out in the open there's a, a kind of facilitator oh and really if you think about it if you're if you're open for many hours in public space it's really a uh, shift of facilitators so the next few pieces since then have all had uh paid facilitators and also realize that I need to write a score. Like I can't just be like, in, so they're becoming weirdly um, a little bit more like theater in some ways, you know? Same. So I do a piece called, that's called Public Trust that actually has a training video, a score, uh, a description of how to put a casting call, what kind of person should be cast. Uh, so, but the economics of it are brutal, right? Because uh, they're stupid, right? It, it, it's like an, an art institution has to raise tons of money and then you turn on the piece and then it's like, it's like a water tank. It's just like the water starts spewing out. None of these pieces, Key to the City, Public Trust, Fake ID, uh, all of these pieces I've done, they all run until we run out of money. They never run out of interest, right? So I always think that and the arts are interesting because the visual arts are supposed to be free for the viewer, but they're not supposed to be free for the collector. Theater is supposed to be, uh, we agree that the social contract with theater is that it charges us and film, right? You could imagine that key to the city, we could have just done a little calculation of the, like, the cost of transaction, I don't know, it's like $15. And it could have run until, people stop wanting the key to the city, right? Uh, and uh, if you think about John Rubin's um, conflict kitchen, it's a perpetuating model. So as long it's a work of art, that's a restaurant and the food's for sale because that's not weird selling food. In fact, we're suspicious of free food. Uh, so, uh, so that was an artwork that could run for five, six years. Um, so it's just interesting that we're we're trapped in this thing where we can't, and the lines make no sense. Like, you know, Creative Town could have never charged per transaction because then the funders would not have given. Like the whole system is stacked against it. It's like, I totally, I mean, I'll just say real yeah. quickly, Paul, I think you should totally charge for Kansas City. And I think, you, I think this thing could be its own financial machine. I really, in my heart, right. believe it. And I don't think people would balk at the limited amount of cost per key to make it magical and self-sustaining. I think it's totally within within the scope of what's reasonable for you. Yeah, but I don't think those the problems are, we have philanthropy locks us into this kind of um, inequity, right? It's like, uh, I could charge for it, but then the arts institution could never raise, could never apply for a grant to make an artwork that sells stuff. 
that that we leave to the realm of commercial galleries. But commercial galleries are not interest are not populists. They don't want to sell fifteen dollars. Museums have museum stores. That, that's what's crazy. But you can have a museum store. <laughs> it's like I don't I don't understand. Uh, so well, listen, how but Jay, do... you know, but I think I think the thing just to say to answer Jay's question briefly. I think the budget for your project with Crave Time was like eighty k. But that said, Crave Time built has a built in team that schleps around that's on a different budget line item. If you were to ask a city public art department, as Teresa knows, they don't have a robust team that could come in to work on. So you got to pay all those. So the budget just goes, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the reason a fierce festival can produce it is because the, the Commonwealth Games are in Birmingham this year. And the Commonwealth Games, like the Olympics and all those things, produce a cultural program. But the Commonwealth Games this year was like, instead of arriving on a city and producing commissioning culture, we're going to take the money for the festival, for the cultural part of the Commonwealth Games. And we're going to kind of sub-grant local arts organizations to then produce things. So then Fierce got like this ginormous chunk of money and they're like, oh, all right, what are our dream projects? And they're doing like three of them. Um, but when is it? But it's, it's a, asking when is it? Uh, May twenty fourth is the opening, um, and uh, and the main location is the central train station, new station. Um, cool. But cool. it it is interesting. How do we make sustainable models? You know, like I've always been thinking, it's very hard to teach this kind of art because how do you how do you so, so I've been trying to think like, what's the studio equivalent? So in the last four years, I've shifted my teaching to be like a theoretical class about public sphere and public art, but then a very hands-on class about uh, risograph printing and making books and cheap prints. Because I'm like, well, you either make, think of the mural, right? Like the giant thing that's in, on one side that everyone sees, that's one way to distribute an image. And the other one is to, make a multiple that's cheap that is can we produce diy so like i teach the students like public sphere theory and what is circulation but then it's also very hands-on it's like this is a super cheap way of making books zines prints and um and and so it's not as well known but i know you well enough to know and something that i'll tell the artists here about you paul is you are known for your artworks but you also have a superpower, which is your ability to give advice to artists about the realities of the art world. And, uh, you, really, and you really have <laughs> lots of really incredible thoughts about it, which you're kind of you know, leaning into right now, but I've always really appreciated it. You know, I think you said something to your students like, just so you know, if you wanna make a living as an artist, just selling art, you have some statistics that are just like insane, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the most depressing lecture I give graduate students. I have a lecture that uh, <laughs> data mines, there's, there's like a database that no longer has public access, now you have to pay for it, that ranked every one of us living and dead as a numerical thing. So like number one, Andy Warhol, number two, I don't know, like Joseph Bush, number three. Like I think I was number uh, eight or nine thousand at one point and but all the way to like number six hundred thousandth artist right and uh and then what i would do is i would find the artist that was at the threshold of the one percent and then you'd be like never heard of that person so then we'd be like okay let's find the person that's a threshold of 0 0.1 percent and then you'd be like oh i think i know that artist and then i'd be like yeah, but that artist has a trust fund or that artist uh, actually has a spouse who's a doctor, you know, like, and I would be like, even at that threshold, the artist is really not making a living. And it's just a super depressing picture of all the wealth is concentrated at the very top. And just when everyone is ready to like quit, uh, then I show them a chart of income distribution in the world. And it's exactly the same. You know, and I say the art world is not a magical kingdom outside of the world. It is in the world. It's not better or worse. You know, it's like the same kind of economic injustice in the world is in the art world too. Except of course, uh, it feels much worse because it's us. <laughs>
<laughs> but that said, that said, I think. Okay, no, I'm just gonna say something, and yeah, then you can't even. Second. I was just gonna say, and then you can't even pay fifteen. You can't even charge fifteen dollars for a key. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's such a good point, Teresa. And certainly, um, please, folks, ask more questions. Paul's such a generous speaker, and time flies with him, as I know. Um, any other thoughts to jump in? Um, questions. Well, one thing I was thinking about um, is the way in which. Um, specifically the keys to the city um, project. I mean, it is free and you do, Paul, put everyone on equal footing in that project. There's no sort of hierarchies, everyone's the same. And I think that's what's one of the things that's so beautiful to me about that project. And then it's then it goes and highlights the capital system that we all exist in so much more. And so I was just wondering if you want to say anything about sort of the politics of that and it, and if and is that a big part of um of the project and your thinking and and how much you think about that. Yeah, I do and it's difficult because you know some of my peers like NATO, he's very fierce, uh, also Claire Bishop who I actually met through this project and then I ended up co-teaching with her for many years and uh and I always think like, oh, I'm a political artist, but my politics are very soft, right? It's it's like there's humor and it's nice and I give gifts, you know? And uh, so I think, I mean, it takes all kinds. I mean, there's politi political art that's about the politics, but then there's other ways in which you can just enact the politics, right? Like, um, and I think every decision like that matters, right? Like you get a budget to make an artwork and you could be, I could make it bigger if I send it to be made in Mexico or India or China, you know, uh, because labor is so cheap. Do you make that decision? Or do you, and all those little decisions add up to a different kind of politics that maybe is not an image in the work, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So what I always try to see is like, if I see who participates and does that result in the kind of politics I wanna see, um, that's sort of, so like at the new museum, they asked me to do one of these kinds of pieces and I was really torn because I wanted to do it in the sidewalk outside the museum. And we and we kind of couldn't because it's, um, this public art is such a pain in the ass. It gets really hot in that sidewalk. So we're like, we can't have someone outside there for so long. Mm -hmm. But then it resolved itself in another way. Like all the participants, I mean, all the performers were high school students and they were paid all summer as their summer job to be the performers. So then it was like, well, who's the public for your work, right? It's like, okay, so there's the museum public, but I'm like, but those 15 high school students were also a public, a really microscopic public that was deeply affected by owning the work, right? So, um, but again, the piece in itself was not about any of that, uh, but- uh, I think yeah. I, I see what you mean. I love the way that you have the sort of like, in the Birmingham iteration, the everyday gentleman that I forget his name as the, on the other end, like, so everyone's equalized by getting the key, but then on the other side of it, by being like bringing the everyday person in as the person that you get to actually go visit is really interesting. Yeah, Daniel was really interesting because we were like, maybe he doesn't understand what's going on. Like, like does he really realize what's going on? And we asked him, why do you want to do this? He's like, well, I hope this will inspire my neighbors to be more generous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But it is also interesting how much it says about private property too. The fact that like, we are so like, you're going to just let anybody in your backyard? Like, that's insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, yeah, it's like once you start to push on those things, it becomes endlessly interesting. There's a mall uh, in one of the suburbs of Birmingham that was built over a road. So you know how a mall has like, you enter doors and then you're inside, but there's sort of a road, right? That you walk and there's stores on the side. So because the mall built on a public street, they have to keep the right of way. So, uh, so they're like, so it's a weird situation. So we said, but they're like, but well, we lock it at night, you know, uh, after midnight. So like, well, can we just uh, give a key to the front door? It's a right of way. And they're like, uh, it's public property, right? And, and that fear starts to settle. And you're like, 
well, do you have guards here at night? They're like, yes. It's like, do you have CCTV? They're like, yes. Are all the stores locked? Yes. So then let's just open the door because you have it open when all of the stores are closed from like 8 p.m. to midnight. We're just saying, keep it open from midnight to 6 a.m. And it's like, no can do. I don't know why. It's just like, that's just so wrong, right? Uh, to, there's a mistrust of the public, right? Um, and even museums have it. They're like, oh, we love the participatory artwork. Lexa maybe can speak to this. You know, it's like, it's like, we want you to come to the museum and, and engage people, but then don't engage them too much because people are scary. <laughs> <laughs> totally. totally. And I don't mean, embarrass the collection. Go, Lexa, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go, go on. Sorry, I, I was literally told don't embarrass the collection. Don't, em yes. <laughs> when the paintings blush, it changes the whole <laughs> intent of the artist. <laughs> That's a great name for a show. When paintings blush? <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't embarrass the collection. <laughs> But I do think you have a pretty good skill at also finding like strange riddles in public space to then point out complexity, you know. Yeah, public space is endlessly fascinating and it's really, really contested right now, right? Uh, increasingly so. So, uh, and, and it's very difficult to make work because it, there are so many invisible rules on public space. Um, when Claire and I taught this class, we would never meet at school. We would always meet in public space. And every time we met, in, and every time in a different kind of public space. And we really pushed it. Like we had a few classes on canoes uh, in a waterway, just to kind of be like, yeah, this is public space too. Anyone can go into this body of water, right? And, uh, but what was interesting was going to POPs, uh, public private partnerships yep. where sometimes we would just take tables and form a group and a guard would immediately come and try to kick us out and I'm actually very shy in those situations but Claire would be like why well what's the rule why can't we oh, be God. here <laughs> and uh, it's, good. it's good you had the enforcer with you yeah yeah she's just like Ugh. hey one can we um ask one last comment thought someone sure. cloudy you're muted oh okay so uh, you know one thing that goes in my mind is now that you spoke about your project is the relationship between trust and bureaucracy. I have never thought it, I never saw the connection mm. of it, but you know, like, of course, once you get into the commons in public, the whole issue of bureaucracy comes up and relates to, and that, I don't know, like, I, I don't really know how to phrase it, but there's something there which I think is interesting, but also because you said that you like bureaucracy and I hate bureaucracy because I live in Italy, which is like where, you know, <laughs> a place where bureaucracy is just madness. Bureaucracy is madness, but, but I think you have to think of it as a material and some materials are, are very hard to use. I mean, they're, you know, they're uh, resistant to being formed, but, uh, I think the best example of, of how bureaucracy is interesting is when I did the project in Brazil, right? Uh, and I said, I wanna change the locks to the main entrance to the Matarazzo Pavilion. And the curators were like, yes. But then a few days later, they're like, uh, the legal department says you can do it, but every single person has to sign this huge piece of paper uh, uh, agreeing to these rules. So you have a choice. You can say no, or I read the paper and I'm like, it's beautiful. Uh, the legal department wrote the implicit rules on how to behave into a museum and they made them explicit, right? They were like, if your backpack is too big, put it in the locker. Uh, don't eat in the museum. Uh, don't go around yelling your political or religious view. If you are have a minor or someone who is a dependent of you, you are responsible for them. The, these rules. And then I said, uh, yes, let's. I, everyone should sign it. I said, but can we make it really big? And everyone signs one piece of paper, so like all the signatures start to accumulate. And they were like, we don't care as long as the document is signed by each participant. So the piece got way better because then no, people were 
it added this very deliberate moment where people were like, I see my name accruing with other names. We make a public and these are the rules. This is what an exhibition is, you know? Uh, and then I made the director, the curators and myself sign it as well. Um, so it doesn't always work that well, but there are moments when bureaucracy is like, it's like judo, right? It's like you go, and then uh, it works for you. So. I wanna thank, thank you. Okay, Claudia, go ahead, jump in the room. I think as a challenge, you should come and do a piece on bureaucracy in Italy and see what happens. Well, I invent bureaucracies like, uh, like for things like alternative facts, like I, I'm a, a notary public and then people tell me lies and then I'm like, I'm a notary public. So I write it down, I'll put my seal and now it will be a legal document you can bring to court. So I transformed your line to a truth and there's like seals and signatures and special pieces of paper and, uh, and, and I just like pile it on, right? <laughs> and um, so I would, you know, I would be a perfect Italian. I would just be inventing more seals to put on things. <laughs> well, listen, if we want, if there's ever a bureaucracy Olympics, um, certainly we, you would, you could be our candidate in it. Um, thank you, Paul. Everyone give it up for Paul Mears Jonas. Thank you, everyone. We're on and on, we should probably have you back and do that again. We'd love to work with you more. I would like to say also, just so everyone knows, we have a tea time coming up, Teresa, right? Tea time at noon. Yeah. Come back, come back. You get to sign out and, and sign into tea time. So come yeah, hang so out with us. I want to also announce a few things while you're here, everybody. Um, we have our oh, we have uh, summer workshops with Veronica and Amber, and I'm doing an NFT class. If you want to sign up for that, just letting get, getting that on your radar for summer workshop time. Also, we have an all artist exhibition announcement coming. It's our first time to have a task artist exhibition. I strongly encourage you to participate. Daniel, Danielle, who's worked with us for a long time, has taken on the masochistic job of organizing y'all. So just be kind to her as we try to, uh, uh, the Herculean effort of organizing all of you into an online exhibition. But I think it's a great opportunity. Um, thank you again, Paul, for joining with us. You're such a magical spirit and certainly aligned with the ethos here. So thanks for your time. You're and welcome. Next, next Friday is our um, mixer. Nada. Oh my gosh. Sorry. And next Friday is our mixer. And just for the record, our mixer is where we get all of you who are in classes to mix with other people that are in classes so that you understand who else is at the school. We get to know each other because as we all know, schools are meant to actually meet other artists more than they are to meet instructors as much as they're great. Um, so that, that, please uh, join in and get information on that. And thank you again. Paul, thank, thank you. you Paul. Nice thank meeting you, everyone. Bye. Ciao, ciao. World, teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world.